defense is my name. And I have uh, been involved in one um, arrest situation. Okay? I have been involved in a number of organizing attempts to A, teach people to get arrested, as, as well as helping to pick tactics and strategies. When people talk about civil disobedience, I want them to start to think about this. Nonviolent direct action. Because once you understand what it is that you're doing, then you can pick the test. Then you know that you're not just going through the motions to bench your anger. You're not... Um, you are satisfying yourself because you are involved and and you are gaining and learning community. Okay, uh, a very high profile community, one that I have great respect for. Okay, and uh, 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 folks can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Please go out. Oh, okay. Sorry. You need to pick this mic. And um, a campaign, which I have always advocated, because anyone things that we're going to do are going to require that we have a long-range campaign and we can use all the tactics, whether they are um, direct action with legal or symbolic action that is illegal. Okay? So a Venn diagram here explains this. I was part of the group that was arrested at Fremont Island when they restarted. That's what I did. I had a band and water letter. I paid my seventy or sixty-seven dollars after I crossed the line down there and stayed with police folks and in buses and so forth. But before that, I spent a great deal of time going to citizens all over Central Pennsylvania, trying to help them understand that this was something of value, a tactic that was necessary. Because no matter how many letters you write, which is a direct action, which is legal, right? Or um, symbolic action, which is what I do by crossing a line and getting arrested, which was illegal for me to do. Although I don't understand why crossing a painted line in front of the gate at Three Mall Island got somebody so mad that they had to. Charge me sixty-seven dollars. I don't. But I think a discussion about how all these things can go together in a campaign. And I have I don't know five, ten different manuals and strategies on how campaigns can be run, how uh, whole host of issues can be dealt with in terms of what you want to do. If you want to stop the construction of a drill pad, uh, that's a different campaign compared to uh, symbolic action, which would be sitting in, in Chesapeake Energy's office or that kind of thing. So we always have to be organizing, and Dr. Gandhi had a strategy, and Dr. King had strategies, and they all used, used this idea of the spiritual idea, because I think maybe Ben might agree that what was missing earlier on in your, your work in terms of direct action was it wasn't necessarily spiritual. Well, it might not have been well planned either. It might not have been well planned either. If at all. But, but the thing is, when something has a little spiritual basis to it, it also has a little more sticky power. That's my thing. Um, we're going to get to the questions here, uh, but some of the things that I want to bring uh, to light and some of the things that I want to consider Going forward into the questions, uh, where I'm going to open it up to uh, everybody in the audience to pose questions in a minute, um, is 
when could civil disobedience hurt a movement and when can it help it? When we're considering that, when is it necessary? Uh, who should participate? Are we talking the people in this room or the people in the northern tier? Because specifically what we're going to be discussing today is going to be civil disobedience as it relates to the anti-fracking movement. Um, everybody up here has various uh, experiences regarding a variety of different movements that they've been arrested for. Um, but to my knowledge, there haven't really been any concentrated and well-planned civil disobedience actions re related to the anti-fracking movement. And we're going to discuss whether or not there's a place for that. Uh, another thing you should consider, a very simple one, what's jail like? If you're going to be arrested, you should think about that. Are you doing a well-planned action in New York City where the police are very formal about the process and they lead you away and they process you and they release you? Or are you getting uh, arrested in Sullivan County where you may or may not be struck when the cameras aren't watching you? Or they may allow the, uh, the, the, uh, the roughnecks at you before the police show up in a very well-planned and coordinated assault on you physically. Um, Consider where it's taking place. What type of police will you be dealing with? What type of locals are you going to be dealing with? What type of press are you going to be dealing with? What type of reaction are you going to get? Because you have to not think about how much your buddies within the movement are going to pat you on the back for getting your skull cracked, but you have to worry about how you getting your skull cracked or thrown into jail is going to be portrayed in the news media the next day. And how can civil disobedience discourage these developers. In the end, this is a PR campaign and a money campaign. We need to convince people that fracking is wrong and that it, doesn't it does not have a net benefit to the state of Pennsylvania, but we also need to make it very difficult for these companies to operate. Um, as I'm, I'm sure Keith can tell us, because of some of the involvement of the anti-nuclear protests in the 70s in the wake of the Three Mile Island campaign, there haven't been any new permits issued for nuclear plants, not just because of public opinion, but because they have to plan ahead millions of dollars to fight the court cases and the civil disobedience acts that they can anticipate that will result from any announcement of any plan like that. We need to make it expensive for them. So I'm going to open it up to the audience here. The gentleman in the back has had his hand up for a while, so uh, let's hear from you. What's your name? I have a story on civil disobedience that happened here in 1970 on Penn Dot Step. I worked with the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation in 75 and we had a state workers' strike. I was the first one arrested. The state police set a plan up and he smacked me in the face. 564 were state police. They had 48 sequential show of photographs of me in a fight with nine state police. I was 19. I did the same thing you did. I had a pay bed on me. I went there. I put two in the hospital. Went to jail. They beat me. And I don't want any big ball out from my door. Beat the hell out of me. Wrapped my arms up with a baton and forced me where they were going. I'm six foot five. I'm hard to force to do anything. But that day, there were 16 allocations across the state. I was the only one that wasn't part of it. Next day, I went to the steel taxi stand, bought a pack of cigarettes. My, day, my picture was on every national newspaper with Herman Fayol of Troop H of the Pennsylvania State Police. I had two, two courts that I went. Ashton Union, who was Neil Porky Goldstein, who left me down. And of course the State Police wanted me tried on Second Street. First went to uh, preliminary uh, Judge Grimwood. The Pennsylvania State Police got up, four of them, all lawyers, read their riot act of what I did. And you can take those pictures they had and flip them. My story was a political, but so was theirs. These uh, uh, 
actions. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm not finished. Oh, okay. Uh, my picture ended up in Time and News of the Week magazine. As in the caption, it said, DA pickets subdued by Pennsylvania State Police. Of course, in my hometown of Steel, everyone has a nickname. And mine became the DA Pickett. So, I've had experience with police in Lockwood, and I got beat. But I gave them a couple shots. I was 19, I had a problem with being a hothead too. But now I understand, you know, what uh, Donnie did say. <laughs> this is what I'm about. Before we get into high track, I just thought I'd share that. Thank you. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate your story. Um, going forward, I'm going to try to, to keep it to uh, the issue at hand. Um, if you want to tie, if you want to tie your personal experiences into it, that's that's more than welcome. But I'd like to open this up to questions uh, or thoughts for consideration and comments that relate to civil disobedience as a tactic in the anti-fracking movement uh, and and how we how we should go forward. Let's open up a debate as to is this the right option. How should we do it? Should we do it at all? And what are some of the things that we need to take into consideration going forward? Sir. I was really struck by Nate's comment that civil disobedience and activism isn't necessarily the same as me. And I'm wondering if anybody's given thought to the circumstances under which civil disobedience might be effective in the anti practice um, if I can take that one, there's a there's kind of a, a an idea that's been floating around amongst a few of us recently. Um, I'm not going to name names, should this actually come to pass. But there's a farm up in central Pennsylvania, just a little bit uh, towards Punxsutawney. I think Julie knows what I'm on to here. Uh, and the farm is an organic farm. It's been in that family for a long time, decades. And uh, those folks have put their kids through school with that farm. And they did not lease for natural gas drilling, but their neighbors did, adjoining property did. They're currently in a court battle trying to fight the well pad from going in on that farm because if the well pad goes in on that farm, that, that adjacent property will be zoned industrial. If there's an adjacent uh, industrial zone to their farm, what do you think happens to their organic certification? What do you think happens to that?